I could spend another 10 minutes introducing Jim Simon, but what introduces Jim Simon the best is letting him talk about his own work because it's so extraordinary. And the one thing that's not necessarily in his, in his uh, VEDA, not necessarily on his web page, it's not that he hasn't put it there, it's that you have to read the whole thing a couple times to realize it. If we're talking about this very broad spectrum, okay, it is so hard for any of us to think about doing something else that's on the other side of the spectrum. If you know what Jim really does in his career, he is about as close as it gets in a single human being and a single program to doing everything. And Jim could talk for hours about nearly everything this society embodies. He, again, organized our first meeting. He's a founder of the society. And I'll say this. When I look back on this meeting, there'll probably be several things that stand out in my mind as, geez, I think this is why we did it. But maybe the best reason for doing this is getting to introduce Jim Simon at my home university, Clemson University. Jim, welcome to Axmount. Well, it's nothing like having um, not much pressure to follow that up with, so. It's a pleasure to be here. I've never been in Clemson. I hardly get out at all. But I will talk to you about um, some work and some perspectives of out of Africa. I'll give, present four different type of vignettes of our work there, and uh, hope you'll enjoy it. When people in the States were, were queried about where Africa was and how they were gonna get there during Clinton's time, some people said they were gonna take trains to get from Florida to Africa. Some people think of Africa as a single state. When we go to Africa to work in Africa, and most notably Sub-Saharan Africa, Sub Africa, where our research is based, we have to recognize as a, as it's a continent. There's over 50 countries, 800 languages, 3,000 dialects. And for the things that we all in the audience are interested in, it's a veritable treasure of genetic resources, including but not limited to medicinal and aromatic plants, when we look at the different wide range of environments. There have been some leading exported African medicinal plants from Sub-Saharan Africa, but usually that's because they only can come from Sub-Saharan Africa. And I, I list here aloe, African potato, buku, cryptolepsis, you know, the alternative for malaria, devil's claw, wild geranium, go to call the for weight loss, pigeum, Prunus africanus, ribos is a tea, but also used for medicinal purposes, et cetera. These are the major ones that people know about. And so because of that, I'm not going to talk about those at all. First, I'm going to talk about kind of the changing of the environment and how our work as horticulturalists, as plant chemists, as plant breeders, and as those that care about the science and, and the earth can do what we can to connect ourselves and our work with our communities, and ultimately with public policy that can preserve and enrich kind of the remaining rainforests. People will talk about Brazil, they talk about the, the devastation of environments in Asia and in South Africa, but they're not really talking about Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm not giving you this in a, in a, it'll sound like a very prescribed, organized approach to the study. And I've tried to make the talk that way, but in reality, some of these studies came years after we began and kind of we reshift the models. But what I wanted to do is present some of the models that we've developed that seem to work successfully. The end message that I'll come up with is that the work that we've been involved with, and we is a, is a large and a literal we, have resulted in over $35 million of cash in the hands of rural Africans that didn't have cash before. It resulted in the training of people graduating with their bachelors, dozens of people being trained in the masters and PhDs, and hopefully some really significant shifts in public policy to preserve the, the environment in, in which, we do, which we're working with. It's also led to the WHO publication of good collecting and, and good, collect, good agriculture and collecting practices, or GACP, and other things that we've implemented with a team of us. And one of the team members is quiet in the back, Dr. Rodolfo, um, Dr. Rodolfo Giuliani. Um, he's been with me since the beginning. And so there's a, a number of us, it's just I'm the one giving the presentation. In this case, I want to talk about Liberia. Liberia experienced a, a civil war for 14 years. Liberia is also um, one of the last remaining areas that uh, host the Upper Guinean rainforest. There's more than 2,900 vascular plants and 70% of the population rely on the forest and forest related products. Now we're more sophisticated and we talk about non-timber forest products and things like that, but in reality, we talk about those plants that are 
unique to those areas. We talk about them as indigenous plants, but often they're naturalized. But forests are reservoirs of valuable biological resources, much more than timber, which is where a lot of laws are focused on. And so we use the term non-timber forest products, emerge as a group of products derived from various forest resources, not limited to plants, it could be limited to animals, insects, and others, but we'll focus on plants in here. So Liberia is really at the epicenter of change. And the question is, if Liberia can hold on to its rainforest, I think it'll bode well for the other West African countries. And the rainforest is shown here, highlighted in the dark color. So using an environmental and economic approach, there's a lot of theory about developing biodiversity and, pro and projects on biodiversity. What I found frustrating as a, as a field researcher, as a scientist, is some of this theory doesn't hold that true to ground reality. That is ultimately, if, unless you could provide opportunities for those that are living in the forest to stay in the forest and make money from the forest, concepts of biodiversity and conservation are very limited. Unless you can show there's economic reason for, for a government that's lacking in money to preserve the forest, then ultimately they're gonna be doing deals above the table or below the table relative to mining and timber and other rights. So we set up an environmental economic approach to development of sustainable exploitation of non-timber forest products in Liberia. And that's what we'll talk about now. And how do we do that? We'd go through the traditional, and I think Jeff and Raoul talked about how some of us in the, in the audience work in the basic ethnobotany area. This is a map of Liberia. This is the same country that along with Guinea and Sierra Leone had the big problem with Ebola. And now Ebola has resurfaced in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And we work in these areas where there's very few roads, where a lot of the people in these communities have never gone out of the communities, where some of these communities have never really seen currency. There's no jobs, there's no currency, but they trade and they barter. And we interviewed them to record their indigenous knowledge. It's always the baseline that we do, if, unless studies have been done already, which then saves us a lot of work. In Liberia, it really hadn't been done. So we surveyed over a thousand household respondents to give ethno-botanical knowledge on the use of non-timber. That's in itself a large study because you have to gain trust and confidence, make sure all the IRB surveys are approved, make sure that the elders and the people in the village understand why you're asking, why you're there. Because a lot of these groups have seen visitors from abroad and they've been promised a lot and ultimately not delivered too much. And of this, so the first vignette is gonna be Liberia, the second vignette is gonna be on Namibia, and the third vignette is gonna be on other models to hopefully bring it together. And then the second objective was to assess and categorize and so once we interview people, then we can have to categorize them. We have to do some type of organization of this massive amount of information, be it botanically on the number of families, 57 families, or the 114 species, how they're used, and then what are the common names, and then how do we have botanical authentication to make sure what we think they're saying is really the plants that they are. And there's a lot of uh, plants here that you'll know, and many of which you won't know, but they've been then organized according to building materials and fibers, again, a little bit outside of our area of research, and outside your area of research, be it a maps, but still useful as non-timber forest products. The different colas and edible fruits, which we'll go into later. Indigenous vegetables and the mushrooms. And nuts and edible oils. All of which could have potential commercial opportunity too, and come from the forest. And different medicinals. And of course there's crossover because many plant species have multiple end uses. I list here on this, you'll see graphonia. Um, which I'll talk about in detail. Pipogeniensis, a West African black pepper, which uh, Rodolfo, do we have a poster on that? Or do we have it on Xylopia? Xylopia, okay. Anyway, the West African pepper, I'll make a comment on, it's really interesting because it's just like Pipe Nigrum, the traditional black pepper, but much richer in linalool and has a sweeter aroma, and oven by itself is used to blend with Pipe Nigrum or could be a new aroma or spice blend. Picanthus anglinensis, which you'll hear about, this is African nutmeg. It has nothing to do botanically with nutmeg, by the way. It doesn't smell like nutmeg, no chemistry of nutmeg, but it's called nutmeg. So we call it now African false nutmeg, Volcanga africana xylopia. We'll cover some of those. And then we assess their collecting practices because there's always a concern that when people go in to collect, how do they collect? And do they collect in a way that's sustainable or do they collect in a way that's destructive? The truth is any of you that farm, garden, go and collect plants, you realize that pulling out weeds is, is laborious. Your time is, is valuable. They view their time as valuable, so often they do what's easiest and convenient, which is destructive harvesting. And so we went to look at a couple different um, types of aromatic and medicinal plants and asked how do they collect the plants. 
Okay? And this was, study was done in 49 communities across seven counties in Liberia. And we then try to ask who's involved in it, what's going on with the current generation, the next generation. There was a comment by Jeff in terms of, or Rao, about the passing of information that's not only scientific, but also traditional. We're in areas in Liberia where there is, there are native languages, but there's not a written native language. So if the older generation doesn't pass it to the younger one, it's actually lost. And in fact, we find that if we survey the people that get involved in non-timber forest products, particularly the medicinal, they're really old. You know, when we started the organization, we we're all a little younger, a little less gray hair. I'm just happy I still have hair. But really there's 50, 51 to 65 years, and above 65 years, we're over 80% of the people involved in it. That's telling you, unless that information is transmitted to the younger generation, there'll be a gap of knowledge. And with the gap of knowledge is a gap in vision. And we know what happens with our current administration when there's facts, alternative facts, and there's kind of a historical revisionism. We don't want that to do with traditional knowledge and what's going on in the environment. And we find that both females and males are involved. The gender component is more or less split because each country, the communities and cultural, you know, defines that. We looked very detailed on how do they collected it, how do they process it, how do they move on it, what's the plant status, what is their perception? We did this work in other countries where over the years, healers and collectors thought that the plants were more difficult to collect. And then when you went out to survey those populations, you'd find that, guess what? Those populations closer to where they live have been over harvested and the ones in the bush further and further away are the ones remaining. So all that helps us develop this value chain to see where our interventions could be most poignant and have a biggest impact. And then we visit the local markets. There's 13 local markets visited in, in Liberia and to investigate the price of the product because ultimately all of our work uses a market first science based definition. We can do pure research and we do pure research at Rutgers all the time in our labs all the time. But if we really want to have something transformative in the lives of those to whom we're trying to touch, there has to be some social economic basis of reality. Otherwise we're doing research for the sake of research. So we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to make all these intersections. Then we had to assess, and so in terms of assessing the traditional and, and normal collecting, I'll just point out very quickly, in the first season, this is only over two seasons, so a short period of time, and this is a quantity collected and amount of damaged trees. This is using xylopia as one example. The second will be in Grafonia. We find the first season, there's really no difference between how we're harvesting relative to the quantity harvested. In the second season, we find a higher yield from that which is using a sustainable collecting method, less destruction of the populations within these quadrant areas that we marked out. And we look at the number of damaged trees, it's proportional to the yield. So in the first year, it really doesn't matter, we're coming in, everything's getting harvested in the traditional way, and everything's getting harvested in the intervention that we used, which is using a type of pole with a cutter at the end, so it pulls down the vine and collects it without damaging the tree and getting the fruit. And the second season, we can come back and see there's a significant amount of damage and less regrowth. And the second season in the sustainable method, there's no damage and the yields look good. So long-term, it's exciting. And we find the same thing with Grafonia, means, meaning that if you take the extra time to use the right technology, the techniques, inexpensive poles, same kind of poles you might use to prune trees, same type of poles you use to harvest cacao, you could actually introduce those same instruments into collecting those from vines and trees from the forest. And in the end, you'll protect the populations and have high yields. And even if it comes out equally, at least we protected the populations. We then assess the domestic value chain for the three leading NTFP. I know people talk about value chains and cold chains and hot chains and all kinds of chains, but really what the value chain does is it looks at all the different steps along the way, all the different actors, and understand where are the weak points, and the weak points then is where you could identify the interventions. And so here we looked at 140 informants. These were mainly agents and sub-agents. Now look at the gender difference between male and female here. When you get to collectors, it's more or less split. When you get to those people that actually handle the money, that buy the product, they make more money as it gets further and further away from the bush, just like as you get further, further away from the farm, the money and the income is higher. We have 81% that's controlled by male and 18% that's controlled by female, and that's because they're further away from home. The males are not necessarily needed for the domestic issues of, of cooking breakfast, lunch, and dinner for both the men and all the children. And so the males have more freedom, flexibility, and they like to control the money. If we look at the socioeconomic um, background, this, a lot of this work was done, the PhD student, we were talking about how important it is to train the new generation. Rodolfo and I just finished training Larry Wang. He'll be the, he just gradu he's graduating now. He's gonna hand in his dissertation literally tomorrow, and he'll be the first 
PhD in non-timber forest products to go back to Liberia as a faculty member at Cuttington University. And he's on the left, and Mark Robson and myself are somewhere in, in Liberia out there. Anyway, you can see that the primary education, 16% um, have it, up to high school, 65. Most people can't send, can't afford, and there's no relationship between those that are living in the real rural areas with high economics and high education. A lot of them all are self-employed because there's no jobs, there's no restaurants, there's no hotels in these areas. Sometimes there's no roads. And so as we looked at the different act activities that are involved in, along the value chain, we can summarize it, uh, whether it's, it, it's bush pepper, country spice, or, or graphonia, as to collecting experience, transportation. Look at the seasonality of when these products come, okay? How they can, how they can do the value addition or the pre-processing and the grading and the sorting locally, and then create this kind of overview of where things move in that value chain and put a dollar amount to it. And then by doing this, we could find out how much this stuff is really worth any country. Now, when we did this for ethnic crops here in the United States under a USDA grant, we found that all these weeds that we talk about turn out to be over a $20 million cash crop just in the mid-Atlantic states alone. That is, knowing how much people are paying, where they get it, what they're doing. And we looked, we used some of the same models we generated in the United States to look at ethnic crops to introduce those into sub-Saharan Africa. So it gave economic dollars to that amount of trade, because then we could go to the government and say, this is why you need to preserve it or, or save it. If we look at the resource inventories of Grafoni, if we go to a company, and Grafoni is now in over 50 products in the United States, Mark Blumenthal can talk a lot about the Grafonia um, situation too. It comes mainly from Ghana, and yet we find that there's a large population of Grafonia in Liberia. So understanding what the supply chain is becomes important because you can't get an international or regional marketer unless you could let them know what is the extent of the populations. So using some tr very traditional forestry techniques, using a transex and monitoring and counting the actual Grafonia populations in this case per unit area, we could determine how many plants are there. We could determine how many, how many fruits are per plant, how many seeds are per plant, what's the difference between Liberian material and the Ghanaian material, which is what's being done here. And this tells you the difficulty, if you look at the picture on the upper right, how this is a good road on a good day, okay? So you can imagine the difficulty in access to transportation. That's a slight exaggeration. There's a dry season that's less wet and a wet season that's wet. And this is what the roads look like in most of these rural areas. So once you collect it and once you try to repopulate it, so once we find out that there's lots of plant material, the other is can we repopulate into these forested areas? And we find that, yes, you could germinate it, we could introduce them into nurseries, and we could introduce them back into the forest. And when we introduce them into the forest, they actually grow well. This is good to know, because on many cases it, can't, it doesn't work. So what does all this bring, just to one example of Grafonia? Here's a more of, a, of, of, of an overview of Grafonia. It's a source of 5-hydroxytryptophan. Seeds are used as an antidepressant to treat serotonin deficiency syndromes. The science, by the way, isn't that strong but consumer market is relatively strong. It's used in the treatment of headaches and weight control, and it's found in the U.S. supermarket. This is just one commercial product. I'm not advertising that. I think, Mark, you're gonna talk about adulteration of it. 5-HTP was the only product we haven't had to publish on because all the commercial products actually came out to meet the label claim. So it's really odd, by the way. We always like to talk about adulteration, purposeful and non-purposeful. 5-HTP actually looks pretty good. And anybody that's looking for weight loss, antidepressant, anxiety, particularly after you hear my lectures, then go out and use Grafonia because it'll be good for you. And this is how we use training. Okay, so the communities that we have are not that literate, so in concert with our African partners, we put together these laminated pictures. These posters might be the only picture they have in their hut, in their house, but it gives you do's and don'ts. Now that takes a lot of science and decomplicates it and puts it in a language that communities can use and they need to use it because by doing grades and standards, you get a premium price. This Grafonia industry and Vokanga industry, in which we've done similar work in, in West Africa, we don't take credit for it, but at the point where we started, there were no grades and standards, and the markets were only about a couple million dollars per year, and now the markets for Grafonia and for Vokanga are each exceeding about $12 million per year export, and they use these kind of grades and standards that I'm showing you here. So in processing, it could be very simple, from drying, getting it off the ground, to using nets, technologies, things off the ground, or at least on clean tops from good quality to bad quality, separating it out. And then on the lower right-hand side, you'll see the sheet that you can't read, but that's a product specification sheet. So we work with the African communities to produce the same specification sheets that American produces here. Randy, when you guys sell Golden Seal, you know, your Golden Seal comes with a product specification sheet, wherever you are in the audience. There you are. Okay, now your product specification sheet may look different, 
but it gives the confidence to the buyers and to the consumer that what you're selling is what you're telling you're selling. Africa doesn't have that, Sub-Saharan Africa. And so often when they did export, they would export to Germany, they'd export to China, and then not coincidentally, the Germans and the Chinese would go back and say, well, the stuff looks great, but it doesn't meet quality. And you have two choices. We'll either burn it, or we'll buy it now for a dollar a kilogram rather than six dollars a kilogram we sent it to you at. Now when they send them these product specification sheets, they don't say that anymore, and they pay what they should be paying. So it minimizes and empowers the communities at the local level and at the export level. So here's Grafoni in Liberia now. Here's a group of Liberians. These are Grafonia collectors from one of the cooperatives that we helped organize. The Grafonia pods and mature Grafonia seeds are up, up on top. And this is Sam Kofer on the bottom. I used this slide before, so if anybody's heard this talk, forgive me. But Sam Kofer is the only PhD forester in Liberia, but he's making believe he's a farmer, by the way, and selling to another person this bag of Grafonia seeds, okay? So it's really a set, staged slide. But what's not set and staged is that reddish bag that contains Grafonia seeds that's enough to pay enough earnings to feed a family for one month of seeds that come from the forest floor. That's the message. And when you have thousands of pounds of this Grafonia, enough to ship metric tons out for containers, it becomes a very high value crop. And we've done the same type of models with grains of paradise, saffromomum, and black pepper, and West African black pepper, et cetera. Another story that comes from this in the same area is, is African nutmeg. This is a member of the Mis Mr. ACA family. It grows in for second primary and secondary forests. It's really rich in a compound that the market has seen. It's a multi-million dollar industry, but it's not going anywhere. It's an unusual C14 compound called myristolid. It's really two compounds called myristic acid. It's used for arthritis, inflammatory and non-inflammatory arthritis, okay? And it's also used in animal care industry. But the product that they throw away after they make it, so here's a cooperative we helped start in, in central Ghana. We have this about 60 metric tons of this product that's now imported for combo in the United States. And you see in the upper right-hand side this pot of this um, dark chocolatey met, um, stew. When it first gets boiled, because it's from the seed again, it smells like chocolate. It's great. It's like being in like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. Those working cacao would love it. 20 minutes later, those chocolate volatiles are dismissed and you get these fatty acids that remind you of being in a fish factory a couple days after the fish have been collected. And it's those odd, unusual smells and odors that we're really after because when we really look at it, okay, uh, the cedar meristic is more of a, a clear product. This is from the University of Ghana from the pharmaceutical engineers on the right side. The part that they were throwing away was the part on the... I'm sorry, the part on the left side is where the sedum ristic acid is. The part on the right side is what they were throwing away. It looked interesting to us, so we did, spent many years looking at this, and these have vitamin E analogs, so guanic acids in it. And from that, we find that these are far more bioactive and more valuable than C14, although this was never known. So these are new compounds. We did a series of studies that led to two different patents on both antioxidant and neural, neuroprotective um, for strokes and other aspects, and it looks like it could be promising, potentially, and mitigate against psychological resiliency factors as well. And so we have those extracts we're now with Mount Sinai Medical School to look at, look at in addition to the other stuff we work with them on grapeseed extracts. So science can really help generate interest, because now with this interest, more people are interested in the combo butter. So the patents are important, but really they're important to drive the market. They're really, in my view, they're not important for anything else except to get industry recognize what it is to give some people some IP protection so it's worth their investment, and then to help move in the protection of the forest and to better the communities. So from indigenous herbal herbals, you can get these others, and this is another story with King Kaliba. Anybody ever tried King Kaliba in their audience? Oh, well, Mark, you've tried everything, so you're not fair to ask, okay? I didn't say it was good, by the way, I just asked you if you tried it now. This was brought to our attention by other people, and this was a, the bush tea. Each country has a bush tea. America has our mint, we have our chamomile. Other teas have ribose and honeybush. It turns out that Senegal has King Kaliba. And they've used it as a tea and they sell it, and as you can see how it's wrapped up in the leaves, it's only from the wild collected, okay? This is from the Senegalese community. So in concert with the School of Pharmacy out there, we went in there to develop it as a tea, as part of one of our AID type of projects, and this is just background of where this plant comes from. There's a lot of studies looking at its anti-cancer activity, particularly in other countries and other regions, in other species, by the way, of Combretum, that this is microcanthum. And ultimately, particularly with Rodolfo's leading work and with Bev Tepper, our Century Science Program and our African partners, we started to show that this could be actually packaged and sold in the States, in Japan, elsewhere, but it makes a very good quality tea. And in doing so, we also found that the populations differ in their taste and aroma. 
Okay, now in Africans, they really like everything that tastes bitter because they see bitterness as not negative. We see in the States everything that's sweet is really good and bitter is something we want to avoid. In this case, we wanted to identify populations that varied in their aroma and taste in order to make a tea that'd be compatible for the Senegalese audience, another tea compatible for the European or the American audience. These are the collecting sites where we went out to collect in Senegal. This is what it looks like if it's, once it's collected, this is the shrub, this is the dry teas. And we started to see this is pretty rich in anti-inflammatory, but we know now that a lot of medicinal plants or ones that are bioactive are ubiquitous in some anti-inflammatory activity. But when we look at the literature and we look at the previously identified compounds from Kinkalib, it's pretty phenomenal, okay? It includes beta cytosterol. You, th you tend to think of that for stinging nettles. You tend to think of that as sol palmetto, prunus africanus. It has different catechins and other compounds that are in green tea and, and others. And if we do the typical chemical bioactive fractionation, this is just a couple of slides looking at a, a, a few of the antioxidant screens or the ROS screens, and extracting them using different solvents, we find that when we extract it, um, again, using different solvents, we get one extract that includes some of the catechins you could find in, in tea, in traditional tea. We, we elucidated these structures with MS and NMR in comparison authenticated, but then we have this other N-butanol fraction of which the catechins, others don't come out, but we find these new flavone alkaloids. This is nice because it was the first time we discovered these compounds in any plants, and we found that this new ring structure exists in this plant with new compounds. <coughs> and so we looked at the biological activity and we looked at the chemistry and we named them kinkaloids. Okay, kinkaloid A to give honor to the plant itself. And because we're working at Rutgers, most of you know the work by Ilya Raskin. They do a lot of work on anti-diabetic agents. They have really good assays. And we want our student to be trained in this. And even though it was not used in traditional medicine for anti-diabetic activity, it is used as diuretic. It had chemicals and chemistry in there that gave us the hypothesis that it could be effective. And in fact, we subjected it to a series of different studies, looking at glucose lowering activities from the leaf, from the different extracts, look, looking at Pepsi-K and mRNA expression using human cells. And then ultimately, all those look promising. And then we conduct an animal study. This is a picture of Kara Welch. Many of you in the audience know Kara because she's now with the FDA, okay? And we find that the animals were allowed unlimited access to this high fat diet. It didn't result in any weight loss at all, but it did result in a significant glucose lowering activity through all the different tests we looked at. In the end, we were able to get a patent. It was awarded in 2015 as an anti-diabetic agent from the leaves. And again, we use this as a way to draw an industry now. And this is, these are extracts could be used in the cosmetic industry, could be used in the food and beverage industry and more. So that's one vignette from West Africa. A second vignette is now from Namibia. Those of you that watched Star Wars, the new movie of Star Wars, and you saw the red sand dunes, some of that was filmed in South Africa, or other parts were filmed in the red sand dunes of Namibia. It's a beautiful country to work in. This is done with a whole additional team. This is funded by the Millennium. A lot of different people are, were involved. They're listed in here, most notably Thomas Brendler from Plantophile of the, Amer the African Association of Medicinal Plants, Eric Feiter and Denzel Phillips from University of Namibia, and the National Botanical Research Institute, because we always work with our colleagues at their local national institutes in different countries. And here we, here we were given the task to collect and identify all useful plants of Namibia. That's kind of cool, right? That's not bad. Is, the good news is three quarters of the country is deserts. There's not a lot of plants. The other quarter is really a lot of plants. But so we had to revise the indigenous flora. So we had to look at the revision inventory of data. And we got paid actually to do a historical literature search. And, and actually Thomas went to, to Europe to look at some of the libraries because when the Germans colonized Namibia, they kind of forgot to leave any of the information back in Namibia. They took it back to Europe. And we had to do an inventory of useful plants. We did that through pulling out the herbarium specimens, looking at the literature, looking at the historical literature in particular. So this really began in the 1800s where some of the, some of the German explorers came and did some of the botany, early botany of it. And then we looked at the anthropological and ethnological literature. And then we incorporated with the modern literature. Very few people do this and do it in a way in which it could be done. We went out and studied and surveyed with the, the healers and the, the communities themselves. And most notably, we interviewed and taped um, what was Namibia's most eminent medicinal plant scientist, Dr. Ebert von Cohen, who lived for years and years with the Sands tri tribes people. Since the study started, he actually since passed away. Uh, this is a picture of him, though, to give honor because he was so valuable in teaching us so much about the plants out there. And those, from this, we developed this incredible map of originally 1,800 plants. 1,800 plants that didn't exist after, um, that wasn't in any one single database. 
And then we had to ask, what do we work on? You got 1,800 plants, how do you make a decision? So we selected it based on, on different criteria, of course, based on the conservation status, the sustainable and collecting of cultivation. If it was endangered, we didn't want to work on it because no matter what you do to try to protect it, if it's endangered and somebody thinks it's valuable, they're gonna go and collect it as well. And industry, potential industry support. And so from that 1,800, we realized that there were duplicates from common names to the botanicals. We brought it down to 1,400, then to 800, and then to 250, and then went through one of these national committees, and we narrowed it down to 130 species. And the stakeholder interest then was based on these selection criteria. Is it indigenous? Is it non-toxic? Is it not known, not endangered, cultivated? And key indicators of medicinal applications that we thought from the industry informed us that they were interested in. And then of course, stakeholder interest. Stakeholder at the community level, stakeholder at the potential industry level, because without that engagement of a champion, it won't go for. So each of this, we, with each of these criteria, each of these plants were given a score. We, built, we made an algorithm to be able to look at it. And from this algorithm, each one was numerical. And then we looked at the 250 highest scoring plant species. And then we created the list of the top 130 plants. So with the top of 130 plants, we went out and then collected the 130 plants, plant species. We ain't, well, our contract was 100, but you know you never do what, what you, you, nothing always works out easily, so we always put in a certain percentage more, so we collect 130 species and just a couple pictures. We obtain supplies, we do everything legally and properly. It takes a lot more time to get the permits, but it's something then we're proud of. We don't slip seeds in our pockets. Sometimes we're tempted to, by the way, but we do everything in a proper way, and doing research in MMB is not easy because to them, everything is valuable and everything is Namibian, even if it was a naturalized plant into the country. And these were some just collection overviews. So this is a picture of Namibia up near where that blue arrow is, that dotted area near, next to the next to what is the Atlantic Ocean is called the Skeleton Coast. That's where you, you visit, but you don't leave, where ships have been wrecked and you see just piles of, of ships and bones on the actual beach itself. So it's, it comes Skeleton Coast for a name. You know, Cape a Good Host, the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa was actually a terrible area to ship, have ships go through, but they named it Cape of Good Hope rather than Skeleton Coast in order not to dissuade people from sailing through. In Namibia, they had to go through, so they didn't bother renaming it. So this is here, we collected 27 plants. This is, you have to really know where you're going. These are some of the species that were collected. These were authenticated by the botanists at the National Research Botanical Council who came with us on the, on the collecting trip. What's exciting about this for Rodolfo and I, it's very rich in coniferous species. It's very rich in the frankincense and the myrrh of the Bible that you always hear about from the Saudian Peninsula and East Africa, but you don't know that there's these other really cool species with unique chemistry for aroma, for other applications in northern part of Namibia. This is the second collecting trip. This is near the Caprizi Strip. Caprizi Strip is that which then forms into Botswana, Namibia, uh, from Namibia into Botswana and Zimbabwe and Zambia. And from here we had another. You could see what the landscape would look like Okay, different species that we collect in each one of these types of trips and different areas of it. This is a vignette of finding those species that we were tasked to find once we went through the selection criteria. So we were able to collect everything. We don't always collect it at the, at the optimum time in terms of flowering, but you could see some of what the plants look like in the different species. There's some really unique types of moringa there, unique types of tribulus there, unique types of asparagus there that are used, but not common or known outside the country. And in the end, this is how we, do, how we did the collecting trips, okay? And this is what some of the landscape looks like. So you have to make sure you're going with a good car, good water, and know where you're going, okay? Because otherwise it's gonna be a long way back. This is closer to, to, to Swakmohund. Swakmohund is a city right on the coast, to Windhoek is the capital. And this is a picture of, of a different type of geographical landscape. So with all these, we have it back, now we've identified what do we do with it? And so in concert with Ilya's group, and Mary Ann, you've been involved in the Gibex program, they developed a Screens to Nature program. It's based on assays that are brought in as a kit. The kit's a loosely term, it's not like a, a chest where you open up and you pull it out, but it's small kits that are affordable that allows local testing, pre-screening. It's the new generation of decades ago, you would use a shrimp brine bioassay and other things it would do when you go around the country, around the world to collect to see if there's any activity. It's a very crude qualitative, non-quantitative indicator that could give you false positives for an application, but still shows you that there might be activity, but it's great for education and great for training of younger generation. So in concert with the University of Namibia, Department of Biological Sciences and the Pharmacy School, they set up, we set up the Gebex um, testing site there. 
And these are pharmacological kits, local testing, it's cheap, and it screens using several non-pathogenic microbes as a model organism to go after human diseases that are pathogenic. From antibacterial to antifungal to antiviral, tuberculosis, et cetera, some of them are a little bit wider in terms of their actuality, in terms of their connections, and then for infectious diseases as well. You only need um, two grams of plant tissue, you grind them up, you put in a vial, and then you use a quick test. So this is an antibacterial screen. There's a capture on human saliva. So this is fun because communities love spitting, having spitting contests, students love spitting contests, and everybody wants their spit to be used as the, as the bacterial medium, as a source of bacteria. So again, it engages people. I say that jokingly, even though you didn't laugh, but in a way that really truly engages the people looking at the lab in a practicum. And you can see this in terms of diluted human saliva relative to Staphylococcus in a sterile culture. So where there's no growth or bacterial colonies, if there's no growth, you assume then in the mixture, when you put the mixture of plant material in and there's no bacterial growth, it has some type of antibacterial. Now we know in the, that there's many types of bacteria and it doesn't always work, but it's a good indication okay, for, the, uh, for that there might be some antibacterial. And the same thing as an antimycobacterium screen for tuberculosis. This is used, utilized a non-pathogenic strain as a model organism. Supplied as a freeze powder, so it's easy to bring into a country. It just requires adding boiled or filtered water. And in the bottom, you could see the different clear gel. There's no bacterial growth. There's visible colonies on the left and bottom. So where there's no bacterial growth, it's a hit. And it's quantitative, so you could see a little bit of a hit, no hit, or a lot of activity. And it go, the list goes on to protease and protease inhibitors activity. So it's a very good way to bring screens in for testing in a local country, rather than in the past where you'd collect all the material, promise them results years later, and maybe they see the results and maybe they don't, and then they don't trust that you're sending them all the results anyway. So the antifungal screens are easy. In this case, you, use, you could use baker's yeast, everybody bakes bread. You could buy yeast there, or you could do different strains of yeast, but you look at color changes by using a reagent MTT, which you then would easily bring into a country, and then you could see whether there's complete inhibition or not. And then if you're looking at sleeping sicknesses, more important in a sense diseases, you could look at free living, non-parasitic, non-pathogenic protozoa. This is really a creative way. These screens were published in the literature for years and years, but it was the, the Gebex group that really collated them, found them, put them in a kind of a, this package that said these are the ones that don't, often don't require refrigeration, inexpensive, easy to handle, and, and we bring them into the country. And here the assay again is looking at color differences where something is dead shows an active plant extract on your left, and when you still see that the signs, okay, of, of the non-pathogenic organism, it's still alive after treatment, has no activity. And the same thing with flatworms, okay? Where flatworms are now used in the U.S. for, you know, water, water purification, water contamination. They would put the flatworms in, see if something grows or not, and that tells you if there's contamination in the water. So it's used, actually, in environmental toxicology here in the States. Using it with a different twist to plant bioactivity is interesting, and the same thing with roundworm lethality assay. So we only did uh, 10 of the 20 types of uh, Gebex screens, okay? And even for regeneration, as for wound healing, okay? Very, very crass, quantitative approach. But if we put it together, and this is a University of, of, of Namibia in the Biological Sciences Department, it's a multidisciplinary unit, looking at the 125 plant species, 294 samples created, over 2,086 runs, and then we could do a pie chart like this, which we could then show how many plants showed antioxidant activity, 12%, how many plants showed antifungal activity, 16%, how many plants showed all the different types of activity, and then what you really sometimes look at is those where there's only 1% of activity, where that gets exciting, okay? And this could be on roundworm or protease activity. And then you could categorize, Now I know you can't read it, but that's just to show you the different color charts. The fingerprints are such that they're not unique. If it was the same, then the assays wouldn't tell you anything. If there was not discrimination at the assay level, the assays are worthless. So it does show discrimination, and those that are biologically active for, for one, one application are often biologically active for others. So this is of the top 60. And if we just score it by the type of assay, if we're just looking for protease activity, now, now as a researcher you go in and really dive in and look at that. Protease inhibition um, and glucosidase activity or inhibition or antifungal antibacterial. So if we look at it by assays and total activity, we, we screen it again a little different way. But the capacity building was a major goal. And what do I want to show you here is look at all the undergraduates that for the undergraduate honors thesis, they worked on these surveys. Okay, didn't cost the grants any money. We just bought the supplies. But all these people graduated, and then this is the new generation, we hope, of scientists. Now this is for the masters and PhDs in MMB alone that use Gebex as a first step. 
There's a picture of just some of the students through a couple of different, the trainings were done by myself, Brittany Graff, and Rocky Grazioni. Um, and where's Dave? I, I, mean, I won't take the time, but this is the people from the University of Namibia and from the Botanica Research Council. So when something looks good and something's interesting, then we want to look at the chemical profiling. So we look at chemical composition, the active markets. So those plants from the 120 that we did, we looked at the most promising of those plants from there based on the activity, and we listed them here. The collecting code that is, there's a logical method. Here's Adolfina and Rodolfo. See, I can't have a presentation without both of you there in the lab doing the analytical work on some of the plant species that come from Namibia. And if we look at acacia species, acacia species grows wild all over sub-Saharan Africa, but four species were profiled, some are unique, by the way, to Namibia. And then we could look at the results from the Gebex screen, highlighting in dark green, number three, saying it has the most activity, in light green, okay, it has some activity, and blank of white, no background, there's no activity in it. We look at that, and then looking at the potential activity, then we have some idea of what kind of chemistry we want to look at. And so in this case, with acacia, particularly one that comes from Namibia, it had the highest flavonoid diversity, it was the only sample to contain these mercetine glycosides. And these mercetine glycosides, identified in the sample, could be responsible for the antibacterial, because then we could do mining searches and see what each of these compounds are known to have activity on other species that have nothing to do with Namibia. But it gives us a chance to, hold, to hone in to see what we're looking for. And we've done that in the same way. And this is, again, we could look at more complex, like these are, these are um, proanthocyanin dimers, there's different polyphenols, a whole range of different compounds in it. And then we could really get a very good chemical profile and then narrow in as, as the need is. This is Jem's book, Cucumber. Again, most people looking at the fruit, we're looking at the, at the seeds, at the leaves. And we did the same thing with, with, with a plant called Greeria. Species is different. And again, these are plants that are used often in traditional medicine, but have never been commercialized per se. But now we have a beginning to understanding of what's in the plant's not to validate at all, they don't care about validation, community's gonna use them or not, but it's for confirmation to allow us to do different type of sciences. And here the flavonoid glycosides were identified in the sample that were likely responsible for the antioxidant activity. Now, antioxidant, so many plants have it, it's not, it's not much of this or that, but it gives science to the tip of the traditional medicine. Now, I'm obsessed with Moringa, and here's a unique species that only exists in Namibia. Uh, I'm exaggerating because it really does, doesn't know the border, so it crosses into the neighboring country of Botswana in the desert area. But look at that Moringa. It's very different than the Moringa olifera that you all, many of you are familiar with. This is Moringa um, ovalifolia. And it's rich in a lot of different chemicals. And by the screen and by the, by the chemical test, we can identify what some of these chemicals are. Same thing as Zimonia. Sour plum is used um, by the tribes people, the nomadic tribes, the Sands tribes for the fruit. But this, the leaves themselves could be very interesting, and we've did a lot of work on that. And we have identified the compounds that could be responsible for that, or could be, have been used and associated with in the treatment of cancer, diabetes, or hypertension with other plant species. It doesn't say it is, it doesn't say the plant is, will be effective for those, but it gives us leads as relative to what's in the literature. So from the chemical profiling of all those plants, we've picked four to five species that have patent applications that had an eighth that had commercial utilization potential. We identified the private sector partners, and that's where it is now. Now it's at the issue of Namibia government giving us guidance as to how to file the patent, how and with whom, to make sure that we're doing it in concert with them. But I would raise a point here at this meeting, given the nature of the program and the talks, are findings that we always do worthy of patent protection? Should we? Given the cost, the time, the uncertainty, and often the little economic benefit that sometimes accrues to either the inventor or university of such patents, coupled with a commitment to ensure that there's a robust intellectual benefit plan for the country that's doing it, is it worth doing? This is something to think about and discuss. And patenting and inventorship is different than licensing arrangements for the processing and applications. And working overseas, these are very, these are very delicate um, areas in which one has to talk about from, from the beginning. But in the end, using this kind of non-timber forest products approach and ethnobotany approach, you could see that they can be a driver of change for income generation, preservation of natural resources, good science, look at the eight WHO guidelines, the forests, and you could see some of the pictures I showed. This work just on the medicinal plants has generated millions of dollars into these rural African communities that had no or very little income opportunity and didn't do this before. So with that, we got excited and we said, okay, if it works that good on these really strange exotic botanical plants, how good would it be on the more easy horticultural traditional plants? 
So opportunities in Sub-Saharan Africa, this is some work that we did with the Nsangwe women's community. They were a women's community that didn't want to do anything on farming or income with their partners, husbands, because of violence and other issues. And so it was just a women's community where they excluded the men from the community. And well, we focused with them and other vulnerable populations, such as where the head of the households were, were blind, or in Rwanda, where Rudolf and I did a lot of work on the widows and orphans following the genocide with World Relief that's now established. We just introduced vegetables. It seems so much easier than working on these botanicals and everything else. Now, why I'm talking about this, I'll, I'll show you where it, it's led to, okay? So the woman on the bottom right is, is blind, okay? And she's the, still responsible for the economic driver of her household with all the children. So she's now growing vegetables, fresh market vegetables, and she's doing it in a way where her fields not always look like the upper left, but often look like the upper left, where the quality meets supermarket needs, but more importantly, the local lodges and hotels. Now you know if you're staying near Victoria Falls where the hotel is gonna be anywhere between three to $400 a night and you get all you could eat, they may have a social justice program, but they're not gonna put anything in the buffet unless it's safe and they get it at a good price and they get the quality and quantity that they want when they want it. So we shifted our program into very big, into horticulture. So we applied these market first science models to vegetables and it took off, it took off much easier, much quicker. It wasn't without its problems, wasn't without its failure, but in just one project alone in Southern Zambia, Southern Zambia, this product has now generated to over 5,000 farmers, over 12 million US dollars in the hands of their pocket where they would never got involved in commercial horticulture before. Does they grow a few tomatoes, they grow a few things, they would grow or grow maize, or they just sit and hope that something would happen. There's no social network from the government, so if you don't earn money, you don't make money. So look at this, over $12 million in, after three years, that's not so bad for impact relative to engaging communities and then working with them on it. And these had no prior horticultural background of it. So that got us excited to say, okay, now if we do, it works with vegetables, why don't we now extend that to what we called African indigenous vegetables? Now that may be a misnomer because some African indigenous vegetables were really naturalized hundreds of years ago or sometime, as amaranth is a weed all over the place. But we know quinoa and, and we know amaranth, we know it from South America. But yet if you ask somebody from Africa if amaranth is native and indigenous, they'll say yes. Some communities will say that the purple amaranth is poisonous, others will say it's healthy, and some don't care, but some like the green, some like the taste. So each culture, each country is different. But we saw a unique system because we went out and surveyed hundreds and hundreds of people and asked them what they ate, what they wanted to eat. We did the same way we were doing it at the States, like I mentioned earlier. This is a new project. We lead the USAID global program in linking horticulture and nutrition to improve health and income generation. And we focus just on the unique in African indigenous vegetables, where we hope in the future we'll focus on AIVs for Asia, Asian indigenous vegetables, and AIVs for Mesoamerica and Mer America indigenous vegetables, because it offers such a unique advantage to people. So why do we want to work with indigenous vegetables? A, income generation can be over for longer periods of time. They're often considered as weeds. They're for resource poor households, particularly for women, they're a really good source of just collecting. Potential to address poverty, and often they're associated with, but very few tested on highly nutritious to consume. It could be dried and processed. And so when we look at the nutritional components, so our lab does a lot of work on the nutrient and phytochemical content now on African indigenous vegetables, looking at spider plant, black nightshade, amaranth, and compare it to spinach, we find that they really are nutrient dense. So our goal here is to look at the African indigenous vegetables, find out which ones are nutrient dense relative to the FAO Codex Elementaris, get it listed and approved as a legitimate crop to study, and then you all can do a lot of work on the phytochemistry and the biological activity, because most of these also have medicinal applications. So as we look at nutrition, we think of all the different factors. There's no one answer to nutrition, there's so many different factors in it. But if we break down the different factors that could improve nutritional consumption, product, pr producing those nutrient-dense vegetables, we broke it down into the four A's. You know, it's AID, so we always have to have an acronym, and four A's sound better than AAA, because then you think your car's gonna come and get fixed. So it's access, affordability, availability, and adoption. Adoption would be increased consumption and increased production. And how, how do we do that? Okay, so we, we've been in now year three of this project, which takes place in Kenya, Zambia, and concert with the World Vegetable Center in Tanzania. And a hypothesis is that appropriate interventions can increase access and consumption of AIVs among producers and consumers in the country. So we surveyed them. Again, this is now our third survey to ask them how often they eat, what do they eat, and you can see that they eat them sometimes, they can't afford them, and during the dry season where they don't have access to irrigation, they don't eat them at all. 
but there's a preference for specific AIVs in each of the different countries. So using based on their market preferences, on the consumer preference, we then look to see what their dietary diversity is. This is our first paper that just came out on dietary diversity in Kenya and Zambia, which is really low, meaning they don't eat much of anything that's other than starch. You could take a picture of the plate and know that there's no dietary diversity in it. So we collected data on household consumptions. We started with uh, 500 as a pilot study in both countries. We moved that up to 500 households in each country that were tracked down. And we have a, a funded project now that's looking at 500 households in Kenya, 500 households in Zambia, according to different treatments. So we have one control group, which found they have the similar in exposure knowledge in AIVs. Okay, they would not be given any intervention. Uh, quadrant two is only production intervention will be given. They just show them how to grow it, but don't talk about it. Three is talk about the nutritional benefits as well as show them how to produce it. And then four, we have communities that are not gonna change their nutrient and have no knowledge of AIVs and they'll stay as is. So we have these types of studies mapped out, everything with GPS, sites of surveys and interventions, and that's what's going on right now, tracking them over a two year period of time. But lesson two is we, when we asked the people that had some information on AIVs and or limited production, what were the biggest constraints? Almost 100 said that they want access to better management techniques, technology, and pest management. Well, for those of you in, in the audience that deal with management, production, technology, pest management, it tells you there's a need for that science and your expertise in this area. Hypothesis two is that if we do appropriate promotion and expansion at the high level, it'll strengthen market access and sales. So in this case, we surveyed 300 AIV producers and 75 intermediaries in there, by the way, in the native languages, people that serve it with the, enumer with the, with the enumerators, with people from that country as well. We were not there on purpose because we didn't want to want to influence the response. And we found that if you, in, in, if you interview the husband and wife together, you get a different response than if you just interview them separately. If you interview the woman alone, she will say, we have no food. We haven't eaten in X days. We have no food security. But she'll be too embarrassed and shamed if you, she, can, she can't say that in front of a husband. Husband will tell you everything's fine. They eat everything. So we actually been monitoring and looking at it. So the way we do the surveys changed over time as we became more sensitive to the people with whom and the communities we're working with. Lesson three though, growers report that AIV, AIVs require the same level of management as vegetables. They have difficult to access seeds and plant materials, unaware of improved germplasm, identified problems, high price of fertilizers, farm credit. A lot of it's solicited everybody would have in developing countries or farmers in the United States, where you're asking what are their constraints to profitability. 75% of producers can't access credit, that's no surprise. So we're working on doing innovative act of credit, but our science is focused on improving the germplasm and reintroducing it. In terms of the individuals and households in Kenya and Zambia, we use focus groups to help us guide our nutritional education training, what we call behavior change communication. You can see some of the more graphic oriented things here. So lesson four that we learned from this is parents, grandparents, and even school teachers are far more excited about AIVs when they understand that they could be nutri nutrient dense, or they are. They're a source of pride, source of, source of tradition, they're easy to collect, but they're still perceived to be wild harvested only and undervalued crops. Now if you have more than 20 million people wanting to eat these on a daily basis, I don't see that as undervalued, I see those unique opportunities to improve income and health opportunities for sub-Saharan African rural people, both in cities and elsewhere. So in that case, then we dive in to do what we do best in terms of the horticulture. We determine the different management practices, we look to improve the different varieties. This is a picture of Focado Densa. Um, a world vegetable plant breed in the middle, talking with David Burns, one of our PhD students who's out there. We're working on developing an iron rich amaranth, which we have developed now, and it looks like it'll be ready to be released next year. It's iron rich, so we're gonna call it Rutgers Ironclad. I don't know if that's a good name or not, we're never that good at naming, but we wanna be able to ha have something about the plant in the name of the plant. We've tested this in different countries, including the United States. This seems to be the one line that's stable across environment. Breeding for nutrition is not Breeding for any of the secondary products is tough, but breeding for nutrition is, can be very complex, and, very, and we were lucky in this. So we were doing a lot of selecting breeding for micronutrients, and this first paper is now in press, the Journal of American Society of Horticultural Science. Um, if, the, if, the, if the Jack Map Journal gets caught up, then we'll submit our second paper to you guys here for the society. That's a joke to wake up Lyle in the back. So that's an elemental micronutrient content and horticultural performance of amaranth across different countries and different sites. So we now have an iron rich. Which is, which is really important, okay? 
And in doing so, we also looked at different spider plants. I don't know if anybody's familiar with spider plant, but this plant is used as a medicinal plant. It's used also as an ornamental. There's a Chinese have used a different species of it. But what's interesting about this plant, it flowers right away. So growers will see a flower after six weeks of growing it, or less. So what we decided to do is develop a non-photoperiodic amaranth, which was pretty easy to do, and so we've done that. So we have spider plants that remain vegetative, they're like the Energizer battery, for six months before they flower. So this will allow people to grow the same plot and just re-harvest it. This makes a difference between a plant that isn't commercial profitable to something that is very profitable from a horticultural point of view. And then in addition to that, we look at the phytochemistry. Many of you know me, so you know that I'm Moringa obsessed. This is the Moringa oleifera. We know it's rich in total protein. We know it's rich in total antioxidants. We know it's really rich in carotenoids. It's really rich in vitamin E, okay? But it's also very rich in some of the polyphenols that are health beneficial active bioflavonoids like quercetin and camphorol. Okay, this is a picture of, of one of our colleagues in Senegal, okay? And we hooked up with the Matingo women's group. We got them to introduce and grow Moringa, and excited to show that after seven years, they're still in business. In the first year, they made $40,000 profit because Moringa is also associated with improving immune stimulation. There's not good science to that, by the way, but when you have a significant population that has HIV and or other types of infectious diseases where retrovirals don't work or don't work effectively because the people are undernourished or malnourished, depending on which term you like to use, and you have a weakened immune system or compromised immune system, then Moringa seems to show good activity. There's new work, again, at Rutgers through Ilya Raskin's lab looking at the seeds of Moringa showing that it has anti-diabetic activity. Our focus has always been using it as a natural foodstuff and a potential answer for Africa because Moringa oleifera is from East Africa. So this is a picture of the, of the Matenga women. You can see it's not high tech, right? Some of them made money just growing nurseries and selling the plants and the leaves. Others are using the same tools that they use when they're mashing them for the shima. Okay, and you just dry it, we put it through a food grade type of mosquito screen. Okay, it's really pretty simple. They package it, and then what we do is we do the nutritional labeling to make sure everything is food and safe. So we've done the same thing with hibiscus, and even though most of the world is looking at hibiscus for the calyx and the beautiful, it turns out the hibiscus leaves are just really beautiful. Beautiful in terms of the bioactivity, beautiful in terms of the functionality. Some of this work was done with Kitchen and his group down at Southern University. We do a lot of work with, with that group, and these are some of the lines of hibiscus with the phytochemistry. And ultimately, increasing access, not only at the rural, peri rural area, but it needs to be done at the peri-urban and high school area. These are, this is a program of street kids that were moved from Nairobi in eastern Kenya to Eldoret in western Kenya. And our sites in western Kenya are in concert with Ampath, the medical consortium school in western Kenya, which is the largest feeding program for HIV-infected clients. Over 15,000 people are fed, and they have a problem with their retrovirals not working because most of the clients are malnourished. And so they've asked us to work with them, and so we've been doing this for a number of years. But this was an exciting project because these kids were off the street, and now they're being introduced to horticulture, and they're making money selling a a a AIVs. So good. So there's a lot of acknowledgments. I, I get the pleasure and the honor of talking about it, but here's a lot of the people that were involved in it, the different host institutions that were involved in it. So in summary, what I'd like to say is that our work has focused a lot on capacity building and training of communities, strengthening institutions of higher education, collaborating with our partners at universities, national research organizations, genetic institutions. And we do this by crossing the lines between germplasm collection, evaluation, conservation, plant breeding, biodiversity, and ethnobotany with medicinal chemistry. We try to link horticulture and nutrition using now nutrient-dense indigenous plants. And ultimately, it has to be engaged and accepted by community leaders or crop champions and in bridging the gaps between research and trade. And this is, I think, why we've been very successful because we have a, a strong selection criteria with our partners with whom we work on the ground as well. We do use these market-first models, and as you can see, this is an old report, but I'm still really proud of it because most of us as university, we don't, get made, we don't get the cover of Food and Wine magazine to look at the different spices we've been working with years ago. But we all link it together in order to generate unique opportunities. Now, I don't know where I am on time, okay, but I do have a four-minute clip. It may be boring for you to listen to. If there's no time, or I'll play it. Jim, there's plenty of time for you. Okay, so. Well, he's always going to say that. How about the rest of you? You okay with that? Okay. <laughs> So this is, this is embarrassing a bit because I've never played it before in front of anybody. It has my voice as an override, so I hope it won't come off strange. But we found that using social media and film clips has been a tremendous asset for us as we work ahead. Now, I don't know how to make it. 
This is done by the, the Rutgers Digital Filmmaking concept, Program. To focus on African indigenous vegetables as an economic vehicle to improve the lives of rural communities, particularly women, improve the health and nutrition of themselves, the families, and the community. Came about a little bit overlap the on it. Stream. These communities don't have any computers. The first, these guys were done for the first the time. They were amazing. And you know, we really had somebody with our work. local group bring our community. And so they've never seen themselves in picture. In they've Western never Canada. seen a regular picture, much less a digital concert film. With this is now the biggest treasure that they school. have. So we use this it's involved to socially engage other communities program. to move on the science we want to do once they see themselves. And the doctors at Ampath felt that with the antidepressants and drugs, Patients had better health, and the retrovirals and other medicines would be much more effective. We also saw a unique market opportunity that the indigenous vegetables would appear and then disappear from the local markets. Prices were often very low during the rainy seasons when most people just go and collect them. And then during most of the year, when it was dry, they disappeared. Many people enjoyed them, but they didn't have access to them. There seemed to be a strong market demand, and when we surveyed rural populations in these areas, and we asked them what were their favorite vegetables that they would eat, it turns out that these African indigenous vegetables rose to the top of the list within the top ten. And then by asking the communities and the marketplace, which were the most popular, that's how we determined to work on nightshades, spider plant, and amaranth. Each of these plants could be considered weeds, but we never realized until we started to do this study and other studies since we began this project that, that there are millions of people that consume these around the world on a regular basis as one of the most popular vegetables. Growers that were not aware that they could actually cultivate these plants are now growing them. Farmers that enjoyed eating them now realize that with proper technologies, they can not only grow these AFV crops on a 12-month basis, but they could also grow a myriad of other vegetables that they enjoy eating as well. By providing nutritional information, it confirmed what many Africans knew about these vegetables that they should and would be healthy. So we got very strong engagement and acceptance by communities in the production of AIVs. We've been working with different companies in both Kenya and in Zambia. Both of these companies focus on the production and processing of dried leafy vegetables as their major products of commerce. Yet neither of these companies had access to the nutritional information for the products that they were in fact selling. Both companies were trying to enter into regional and international markets, be it London, New York, Philadelphia, where nutritional labeling information is a requirement to enter into these international markets for themselves. So we're very pleased that Rutgers, in concert with our African scientists and our partners, work very hard to develop the foundational information that they are now using in the development of nutritional labeling on the packages of the dried leafy vegetables. This would never have occurred without our project. And in fact, it has stimulated additional scientists in each of the different countries to focus on further nutritional work. A project like this, the way we designed it, has phenomenal scale-up potential and replicability potential. There is no social network you know, from national governments. These farmers are truly on their own. They work together, often good, sometimes not always so good, but these crops can provide a partial answer to what we're looking for. There's no one answer in agriculture that will solve an issue of poverty, alleviation, or provide markets that are unlimited in value or without risk. But African indigenous vegetables is Victoria Falls. part of that tool of options have a site that we can work every sense and that could be made available to small voters as well as larger commercial growers. We could now expand into other communities and other regions. And as we start small scale, we can now go a much bigger scale. So I would like to say thank you again for the invitation to come. It's clear that you know whenever you do research, it's it's a. Uh, I think I think Dan Hello once.
talked about are great. It's, you know, you, you don't go from destination A to destination B down a river. It's really the exploration along the tributaries along the way that make it so rich, so exciting. And really, I th I'm not sure if we've touched their lives or they've touched our lives more, but medicinal aromatic plants have been a central theme in helping people improve their lives, health, and nutrition. And so I thank you. Truly fantastic times, and it's people like Jim and Simon that's assuring this world is going to be a better place uh, for generations to come. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, Jim will be here for the next couple days, and again, questions can go directly to him. And again, uh, a, a just absolutely a fantastic treasure chest of information you brought us. Uh, greatly appreciate it.